Hello, inquirers. I've got a great episode coming up for you. It's the first of a two-parter on the topic of free will. But before we get to that, I want to give a quick shout out to the folks at Rocky Mountain Atheists in Calgary, May 3rd to 5th, 2024 is going to be the second annual Western Canadian Reason Conference. If you live in Calgary or can get there in early May, uh, check it out. Please consider going. They've got a great speaker list and you can check out the speaker list and buy your tickets at wecanreason.com. Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. My guest on today's podcast for inquiry is Dr. Julian Mussolino. We start our conversation today with Julian demolishing the idea that free will exists, at least as free will is commonly understood. But then he provides a definition that restores a notion of free will, at least at a different level of abstraction. And along the way, we delve into issues of philosophy, morality, politics, and sociology. In the end, I thank Julian for broadening my horizons and helping me grow up. It is with great pleasure that I bring you my conversation with Dr. Julian Mussolino. Dr. Julian Mussolino is a Franco-American cognitive scientist, public speaker, and author of The Soul Fallacy. He holds a dual appointment in the Psychology Department and the Rutgers Center for Cognitive Science. His research spans a broad range of topics in the sciences of the mind, with the overarching goal of shedding light on what makes our intelligence distinctively human. It is with great pleasure that I bring you my conversation with Dr. Julian Mussolino. Dr. Julian Mussolino, thank you for taking the time and speaking with me today on Podcast for Inquiry. Thanks for having me, Leslie. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this topic because I think it's actually one of the most important ones that uh, that we cover, at least from a philosophical uh, perspective, and and that's the, the topic of of free will. But something that I've been thinking about for a number of years in a fairly deep manner, and one thing that I've discovered in my conversations and in my readings is that everybody has a very strong idea of what free will is. And it's very rare that any two people have the same idea of what free will is when they talk about it. So I'd like to start by getting your uh, definition or the range of definitions that you consider in your book, The Soul Fallacy, when, when we engage on this topic. Yeah, I think that's a great way to start. I think we need some uh, clarity because, as you said, uh, free will, as virtually every concept you can imagine, has different senses different interpretations for different people. And that can create a lot of confusion. So we can start with one notion of free will uh, and explore that notion. And then we can move on and say, well, are there other notions and move from there? The notion of free will that I discussed in my 2015 book, The Soul Fallacy, is what some people regard the traditional notion of free will. It has names in the philosophical literature. It's uh, sometimes called libertarian free will, and people feel uh, obligated to say it has nothing to do with the political philosophy uh, okay, yes. because it's not the same thing. So libertarian, right. libertarianism, I'll give you details in a minute, but it's giving you names now. <laughs> yep. It's sometimes, it's the same notion is sometimes called uh, contra-causal free will, same thing, and sometimes it's called agent causation. Okay, so what's that notion? That notion can be summarized very simply by saying that if you believe in that kind of free will, then you believe that human beings, or perhaps even other agents, are uncaused causes. So in other words, that we're primary prime movers. That's one notion of free will. Now, it's not the only notion of free will, of course. Um, it's a traditional notion. And that's the notion that if you hear people say we don't have free will, free will is incompatible with science, that's most likely the notion that they have in mind. 
and we can go into the details about why exactly how it works. But basically, that you know, humans are unconstrained by uh, uh, in, in the choices that they make, and uh, can, and can and and have free choice in, in every decision that they make. Well, that's it's a little more complicated. So. We'll get to the details. Okay, all right. We'll get it. We'll get into the details. So there's libertarian or contracausal free will as right. one broad category. It's right. the traditional notion and one that is people that aren't familiar with it might initially think of when they think of free will. It's also, I have to say, it's also perhaps a very intuitive notion of free will. And some authors have said that this is what our untutored uh, conception uh, makes us believe that we have. And that comes from the fact that when we, so let's say I pick up the, the cup on my desk to have a sip of coffee, and um, I, it's an action that I willed, I voluntarily picked up the cup. Um, if you ask me like, why did you pick up the cup? I say, well, look, I wanted to do so. Um, and if you ask, well, what made you will this act, I would say, well, it's a free act. Nothing made me will it. My will is free, unconstrained or uncaused. So that's one notion. That's the notion of uh, of contracausal free will. That, in some sense, the buck stops there. That, that you know, our actions are caused by our desires, our will, but our will itself isn't caused by anything. It's free from causation. That's the idea. Now, as you can imagine, uh, that has a number of important problems. Um, okay. Well, okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to those. So that's, that, that's, that's one notion of free will. You mentioned right. that there's, there's at least a couple of others. Let's, let's get to those as you enjoy your sip of coffee. <laughs> my, my freely chosen uh, sip of coffee. So now you can say, okay, and you'll see that we'll get to talk more about this notion because that notion, that traditional notion of free will, that intuitive perhaps notion of free will, contracausal free will, uh, den the denial of it, which I think is the correct position, has a range of very interesting and deep implications for notions like moral responsibility and criminal punishment. But we can put that aside for now. Now, there are other ways to, of course, define free. In fact, we can define free will pretty much any, you know, any way we want. So one, that one notion of free will that we could have is we could say, suppose that you are free to act on your beliefs and desires, assuming they're not going to hurt others, right? Uh, and that you're free to do so, free from duress, for example. So if I want to have a sip of uh, a, a sip of a coffee, for example, that's a desire that I have, and nobody's putting a gun to my head saying, Julian, you can't drink your coffee, and I do drink my coffee, then I freely drink my coffee in accordance with my desire and beliefs, and therefore I have freedom in that sense. So freedom of the will in that sense would be freedom to act on one's desire, beliefs, uh, free from duress or constraints. Again, to the extent that these actions are not uh, you know, detrimental to the well-being of others, some, something like that. So that's another conception uh, of free will. And you'll usually hear terms like um, compatibilism or incompatibilism in the discussion of free will. Um, and uh, what the the notion that I just gave you is uh, is, is falls within the the latter uh, definition. It's compatible with what we understand to be you know, the laws of physics, the laws of nature. Right. So the issue very much revolves around that. Uh, most scientists embrace science, the laws of nature, the laws of physics. So when they tell you that. They have free will. They try to define it in a way that does not conflict with the laws of physics and the laws of nature. And that usually means that they shy away from libertarian free will, which is magical. And we can get to why in a right. minute. Okay. Now, of course, there, I, we, I gave you just two ways to think about it. There are, in principle, as many ways as people are willing to be clever and creative. I mean, there's no law of nature that says... This has to be free will. We can define it in any way that we want in some sense. But these are two uh, important uh, notions. And they're notions that, again, people have in mind uh, when they talk about free will. They often don't preface. They just say, well, I, I do believe in free will or I don't believe in free will. And then you have to say, OK, well, qualify this because it's not clear from the get-go what notion you have in mind. And so that's where the confusion arises very often. 
I've heard a third def or a, a third definition, yeah, which plenty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which but which which may or may not be the same, may or may not overlap with the two that we've already provided, and that's uh, essentially the idea that. Uh, free will means that you could have done otherwise. Ah, so that's, okay, I'm glad you bring this up because that's precisely uh, libertarianism, right? Okay, so that is, that is, that is libertarian free will. Okay. That falls, right. So one way to think of libertarian free will or contra-causal free will is, as you said, the so-called ability to have done otherwise. So perhaps to make things, um, clearer for our listeners, we could start using concrete examples. I like to think about that because it really brings uh, out the issues in much sharper form. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's go back to the traditional okay. notion of free will exactly. or libertarian free will, and let's, let's really drill into what it is. Exactly. And then, and then we, and then once we drill into what it is, we can get into why, why, right. why you think that it's perhaps not, yeah. not act, an accurate description of, of, right. of the uh, significant mental powers or mental abilities that humans exactly. have. Exactly. So I think to do that, I, I use, I've in the past rely on sort of one broad analogy. So of course it takes a bit of time to unfold because these issues are not simple. So bear with me. I hope the listeners will bear with me as, as I go through this. But um, hopefully it has the virtue of making things clearer. <laughs> so, uh, Podcast for Inquiry. I'm not, uh, we're not interested in the simple issues right. or, or, and I'm not interested in asking the easy questions. So right. like, let's, let's dive into this because I'm fascinated and I think our listeners are Beautiful. too. Beautiful. Okay. So let's take, for example, uh, the case of a giant boulder that's been sitting on top of a mountain for hundreds and thousands of years, and that sits atop a small village made up of a few houses with people living there. And so let's imagine that after a long, long time, because of uh, the effect of erosion, climate change, and so on and so forth, at some point, the boulder loses its grip on the side of the mountain and comes crashing down and flattens the houses and kills the people in the houses. Okay, so now suppose we ask the following question. If you were to go back in time, right at the moment where the boulder came detached, and ask the following question, if you place the boulder exactly back in exactly the same situation, right? you, you simply rewind the tape, go back in time, mm-hmm. could the boulder have done otherwise than it did? Right, that's a question that you can ask. And here, most people will tell you, well, no. And they'll tell you, look, the boulder is a physical entity that's subject to uh, that's subject to forces that it has no control over, like gravity, uh, erosion, climate change, uh, and so on and so forth. So, under those precise set of circumstances, the boulder did the only thing that it could do. So, in in some sense, right. some big deterministic process unfolded that led to the. Uh, as, as soon as there wasn't enough friction or force to hold it no, up, it just right. it yeah. just blindly fell. And, fell and as, it happened, as it happened, the path yeah. and there's nothing it could have it done otherwise. It. It, that's that's, way, that's, that's right. what it happened. It, and, okay, and those poor villagers. Okay, so now and in here people have very clear intuitions about this. Like, okay, yeah, this is not not a problematic case. So now we turn to a more complex entity, not a boulder. Boulders are not agents, mm-hmm. by the way, in our intuitive psychology. The right. scribe agency beliefs and minds to boulders, at least not usually. So let's take the case now of a, of a young person who has a who had a troubled uh, childhood and uh, you know is a drug addict, unfortunately, and uh, needs money for for drugs. And so, and he robs a convenience store and he you know points a gun at the clerk. They start fighting, and at some point he pulls the trigger and and shoots and kills the uh, the clerk. So now we ask the same question. We say, okay, well, if you go back in time. Mm-hmm. Uh, right before the young man pulled the trigger, and we this is we, we put him back in exactly the same situation. He doesn't know that he already shot the person. We just go back in time and we ask, could right. he have chosen to do otherwise in those very precise circumstances? Here, many people have the intuition that yes, of course, he could have chosen not to pull the trigger, but he did. And that act is blameworthy, and that's why we should punish him. Now, this makes intuitive sense, but when we start to think about it, we realize that the conclusion is flawed. Because let's let's assume that even if the pulling of the trigger was not some kind of reflex that bypassed consciousness, but let's say that there was an intention in the young man's mind to pull the trigger, 
and then he pulled the trigger. Right. They they stepped back, so it wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't just, just they were a, they were yeah. fighting, and then and it, the gun went yeah. off. But like they separated for a moment, and then the, and, he and he decided, decided to very to consciously. Aim. He told himself, "I'm aim, going to shoot him." And ready, aim, and fire, and he does. Right. Okay. Now we have to say, okay, great. Well, where where did that conscious thought come from? It didn't come from the ether or something. It came from his the operation of his brain inside his head. And what governs the operation of his brain? Well, a complex host of factors. Chemistry of his brain, the kinds of genes that he has, uh, and factors like uh, his life history and so on and so forth. So what you can do is you can actually reason back to a causal chain that's unbroken uh, and that is made up of factors that the young man doesn't have any control over. However counterintuitive this sounds, and that's the, that's the thing. The thing is that the crux of the issue is that we have this deep intuition, or some people do at least, that we could have done otherwise. But when we think it through, we realize that we are as determined by a host of factors as boulders are. We don't escape the laws of causation simply because we're human beings. We're part of the causal nexus. And therefore, our acts are caused and they're caused by factors that we don't have control over and that's therefore this apparent ability to have done otherwise is suspect scientifically and scientists tell us look this is no it doesn't work like that now you can say wait a minute but maybe the world isn't perfectly deterministic maybe there's some indeterminacy that plays a part and you'll hear people say that sometimes. But that's a red herring. Mm -hmm. That's a red herring because even if at some point in the causal chain uh, there was some kind of truly random quantum event, let's say, that took place, the young man doesn't control random events any more than he controls deterministic ones. So that, that so so quantum indeterminacy might mean if you rewound the tape because that is truly random the quantum events might 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 be different the second time around conceivably but uh and that might you know through I, i'm not quite sure what the mechanism would be but th that might result in a different action you're you're arguing that even if we grant all of that as un, as, as as much of a stretch as that might seem that's not free will in the sense that uh, the you know in this in this case the person robbing the convenience store isn't choosing the uh, quantum event he's affected by it and it might affect the action but it's not free will because it's he's still being buffeted by forces of which in this case he's certainly unaware and also definitely has no control exactly right yeah so I mean so okay. let's say if you uh, there are physicists who talk about this too so uh, Sabine Hassenfelder for example has all kinds of videos mm -hmm. where she talks about, about that and about the fact that this notion of free will that we're talking about, the ability to do otherwise, is simply incompatible with our understanding of physics. And she's very clear about that, precisely for the reasons that we mentioned. And in fact, this is an old argument that goes back to at least to Hume. It's called Hume's Fork. The idea is that, you know, either, either determinism is true, in which case we don't have that kind of free will for sure, but if you have indeterminacy mm -hmm. and randomness, we also, since we don't control random events, because by definition, they're random. Yeah, yeah, yeah we exactly. Yes. Kind of free will. Now, OK, so that's that's the the essential argument that leads scientists to say, well, look, that, that if, if that's what you mean by free will, then science has a problem with it and a big problem. And therefore, it's very unlikely that this is the kind of free will that we have. OK, so that's basically libertarian free will. There are other arguments uh, on top of that that uh, one could uh, you know, bring to bear on the question. One, one argument is, okay, would we even want to have that kind of free will? And if we think about it for a little bit, I think the answer is no. So I'll give you another analogy to make things pretty clear. Suppose that I invite you to my house for drinks right, so we can talk about free will. That sounds wonderful. I'll, I'll, I'll be there in a couple be hours. There in a couple <laughs> hours. So I fix us some martinis. We start talking. And suppose that at some point I throw my martini in your face with the olives and the toothpick and everything. The first thing that you would ask probably is, Julian, why on earth did you do that? Why did you throw right. your martini in my face? Now, suppose that 
the, so you might say, well, is it something that I said? Maybe you don't like my clothes. Maybe you grew up in France and that's how French people, you know, greet their guests by showering them with vodka and olives. <laughs> and suppose that I said, Leslie, no, it, no, it was uncaused by anything. It's a free act. My hope in this case, that if I told you that my throwing of my martini in your face was not caused by anything, my desires, my actions, the laws of nature, whatever, you'd conclude that I'm insane, not free. And so it's not even clear. Some people have argued that the notion of libertarian feel is in fact incoherent, in addition to being incompatible with the, um, the laws of nature. Now you can try, people have tried, because they are libertarians after all, it's not like they don't exist, and, and they are trying to reconcile their intuitions with, um, you know, uh, with this notion of free will, but I think that just it fails. And and I would I think that if you look at surveys, most scientists uh, have a big problem with this particular kind of free will. Now you might just say, well, you know what? That's just an academic exercise. Who cares? We don't have that kind of free will. Fine, we can move on. The problem is that this kind of free will. Uh, or our conception or our intuitive understanding of it has consequences because it is linked to a particular notion of moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, 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 was, I was going to get to that, yeah. but yeah. So that's why it's not just an academic exercise. We can't just say, mm -hmm. well, yeah, okay, who cares? You can debate it. You can say it's incompatible with the laws of physics, but nobody cares about that stuff. It's just you academics in the ivory tower who worry about that. It's not as... Yeah. Okay, so, so so let me let me uh, all right. So I want to so I actually want to delve into that. I was going to do that a little bit later, but let's 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 talk about that now. I have um, basically I, I'm not a scientist. I try and read as much science, uh, physics, chemistry, biology as I can. So I think I'm reasonably well informed, but I am definitely a layperson. Uh, but I thought I've thought about these issues and. Uh, and, and free will is something I've spent a lot of the last six, six and a half years thinking about and reading about and uh, a lot of introspection. And so if free will is an illusion, if it's if it's if it's if it's false, right, if it's uh, even if it's uh, an incoherent idea or incompatible with mm -hmm. the laws of physics, I, I, I can't argue that because I'm not qualified to. And uh, but when I when I reflect on it honestly and openly like it's, it really, if, if it's an illusion, it's the most compelling one I think I have ever encountered. Like, I, and I'm not talking about other people. I'm just talking about me, but I, there are, I do things habitually. Sometimes I do things without thinking that that is totally true. And I, I acknowledge that, but I also do my best to make the important actions, the ones that are going to have ramifications, I reflect on them, I think about them. And uh, I, uh, you know, from the trivial to the significant, it's, it's can be very, it, it, the extent to which that conclusion goes against almost my every interaction and every perception of the world is very strong. Yeah, it's a, I, I agree that it's when you think it through, it's in some sense, it's shocking. Uh, however, I think that there's, there's a giant silver lining in the sense that, um, so th there's a wonderful paper that I'm going to suggest uh, for maybe you, if you don't know it, and your listeners that talks about all this, and that has a really lovely title. It's called uh, For the Law, Neuroscience Changes uh, Everything and Nothing. So and it, and it really is about free will. It's about paper. All right. Well, I will put I will put a link, a link to that there. to that paper in the show notes. So people that are interested, look at the show notes. There'll be a link to that. Yeah, the paper is by uh, Joshua Green, who's at Harvard now, and I think his former mentor uh, Jonathan Cohen. So he, here's why I say this, because uh, to to um, pick up on what you said about how shocking the um, conclusion seems to be, there is a sense in which. Um, reaching the conclusion that we do not have this kind of free will um, seems to change everything. But there's also a sense in which it changes nothing. Um, and I think what it does change is very narrow, in fact. Uh, and I think it does change those things for the better. So at the end of the day, uh, it's not as bad as people think. And that's another problem, I think, with, and I think you'll probably hear Kevin talk about this next week when you talk to him, that he's a little, he might be a little concerned that people 
uh, in the sciences are a bit too cavalier about saying, hey, we don't have free will without really thinking about what this might, the impact that this might have on people who listen to the message and then think about it like you did and say, oh my God, this is really shocking. So the sense in which it doesn't change anything is that it doesn't, so suppose that you, you know, you have loved ones, you have friends, there are things that you find meaningful in your life. None of that changes. Mm -hmm. If it feels an illusion, okay, none of that changes. You, you don't stop loving your partner all of a sudden because you realize you don't have free will. Um, you don't stop enjoying, unless you really want to, but you don't mm -hmm. stop enjoying all kinds of things. So there's a sense in which it doesn't uh, change anything. Um, there's a sense also in which so some people will say, well, but if you don't have that kind of free will, do we really make decisions or make choices? The answer is, of course we do. Of course we make choices. And there's a very straightforward sense in which we do. Um, a choice is simply selecting uh, one or several outcomes, uh, mm -hmm. a longer range of possibilities. And we do this all the time. Um, even if the mechanisms that we implement to make those decisions are in fact determined, it doesn't matter. So just to give a quick uh, example, if you take, say, I, I like to play chess a lot. I'm not very good, but I really enjoy the game. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, they are human players now, and they are, of course, computer players, right? So they are, you know, computer yeah. engines that play chess. Um, well, when, say, Magnus Carlsen, the former world champion, uh, you know, plays chess, does he make choices and decisions? Of course he does. There's a range of pieces that he could move. And he selects right. to move one. And who cares if his choices are determined by his ability, his memory, his past experience? doesn't matter. He does make choices. And it's him who makes choices, not, uh, you know, some other grandmaster. Um, likewise, when, the, when Deep Blue or now Alpha Zero uh, plays chess, does it make choices? Yeah. Okay, there's a it, it's making choices in the same sense that in the Carlson same sense would take. That now, the algorithms that uh, Carlson runs in his head and the algorithm that the Alpha Zero run are different. And they're both determined by a range of factors, but they do make choices. So denying that we have free will in the contracausal libertarian sense does not deny that we make choices. That's important. And that would be okay. uh, yep. important to point out. So in the end, it doesn't really you know, change much apart from, and we'll get to that, the fact that there are certain practices that I think we, um, that rely on this illusion of free will. One of them is to seek to punish people in certain ways because we say that they deserve it. So that's called. Okay. Revolution. I promise we'll get there, yeah. but I, I want, I, I want to put some, I want to put something else. Uh, I want, I want to talk about something else first, and then I sure. promise we'll get to that. Yeah. So, I gave so the first objection that I that I raised to to uh, to accepting that libertarian free will is false is essentially an argument from personal incredulity, and I realize that's not a a valid uh, uh, argument. That's a that's a fallacious one. However strongly it feels it, it, it feels right. Let me give it. Let me give another personal example, and then we'll get to the soci a societal one. Sure. All right. Um, so I um, I'm a secular humanist. I'm an I'm an atheist, and and one of my uh, and, and over the course of my journey to, to becoming an, an atheist, I realized that I felt that uh, sort of offloading consequences to God, it's God's will, was an abdication of personal responsibility that I found almost offensive. Mm -hmm. We, the reason that uh, uh, our, I, I had this fundamental belief that our choices matter, our actions matter matter because there are consequences. There isn't a divine plan. There isn't a God. This is, this is again, I'm, I'm talking about my perspective. Yeah. Uh, there isn't a divine plan. There is no celestial safety net to make sure everything's going to work out okay. Yeah. Right. The way we are, the way we are, the good and the bad in our society and our, in our, in our lives today, because of the choices that we collectively have made. Yeah. And, and, and that's why the, the choices that we make matter, because the choices that we, again, collectively make today are going to shape and affect the world that our collective children will inherit. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's and to me, that was the, like that's kind of the grounding of my moral and ethical framework. Yeah. So if you say that there's no free will, <laughs> all right, and, and that my choices are not really choices in the sense that is intuitive yeah. and that they are in a sense determined, 
again, that seems like it's an undercutting of uh, of a core pillar of my whole foundation for morale, you know, my, my, my sense of morality. And that's something that uh, is very difficult to square with what seems to be the scientific consensus mm -hmm. that uh, the free will and the in the in the free choice uh, way way of, of conceiving of that, if, if that's true, that undercuts what I think of as as a core moral principle. So two things uh, about this. Uh, yeah, you, you write that it uh, seems, and in fact, does change something about morality, or at least a certain conception of moral responsibility. Yeah. and again, I'm not. I'm talking. I'm talking just personally yeah, for the moment. We'll talk. We'll talk more broadly it's just, later. It's not just but, you. I think many people feel that way. And we can talk about that. Um, but at the same time, uh, what you pointed out is correct. So we are causal, uh, we have causal powers. The decisions that we make have consequences, as you said. Again, whether or not they determine is irrelevant. So let's say that I were to choose now to, you know, if I became crazy and I choose to run down the street and start shooting people, okay, this would have consequences, no doubt. So of course we, ha we are... Uh, agents uh, with certain powers, flexible minds, the ability to foresee the consequences of our actions and to calculate uh, what we should do. Yes, so that nothing, none of that changes. Uh, and so, and we are also flexible enough that we can be uh, changed, we can change or we can be, uh, you know, either deterred sometimes or, or nudged in certain directions based on certain information. Uh, that, none of that changes. So I, I don't think that, um, so you think, for example, of the big societal, you know, threats that we face or concerns that we have, well, we, of course, we should strive to do something about them. Uh, because if we do, then it's going to change things for the better. And if we don't, it's not going to uh, do anything. The fact that everything may be determined or determined plus some randomness, the, 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 the issue here is that this may be true from a broad God's eye view perspective, but we are very finite creatures with finite minds, and we don't have those kinds of powers to see the entirety of the future uh, and see exactly what's going to happen. So the, the, the future, as far as we're concerned, is epistemically open. We can't, uh, we can make some broad predictions that uh, we can predict the weather, you know, a few days in advance and whatnot. But broadly speaking, we just can't predict the future. And okay, that's, that's our predicament. Uh, and what we can do, however, is we can think through possible consequences of our actions uh, because we have those kinds of powerful minds. And based on those deliberations, we could decide on a course of action that we hope will lead to the best outcome. None of that changes. So none of that is threatened by the fact that uh, our uh, deliberative powers are determined by a host of complex factors. None of that changes. On the morality question, there is something that does change now. Uh, and that's, again, the question of why we punish people. So there, there are two, broadly two appro approaches to criminal punishment. Um, one of them is uh, backward looking and one of them is forward looking. The backward looking one says, OK, uh, let's go back to my analogy of the uh, young person pulling the trigger and, uh, and shooting the clerk. Um, we say, all right, well, the crime has been committed. So we go back in time and say, okay, at the moment when that young person pulled the trigger, could he have chosen to do otherwise? And our intuitions tell us, yeah, he, he could. And therefore, we say he didn't choose the right path, and therefore he's worthy of blame, and we should punish him, and we should make him suffer. That's retribution. The problem with retribution is that it's nonsensical now, because we've determined that the person isn't free in that metaphysical sense. And so it makes no sense to want to punish for the sake of punishing and to make him suffer for the sake of making him suffer. Now, you could say, well, there are other reasons that we can invoke to punish him. We want to punish him uh, for uh, forward-looking reasons. First of all, we want to make sure that he doesn't strike again. Okay, so, you know, we punish him for that reason. We want to make sure that... Uh, punishing people uh, becomes a deterrent for other potential criminals. These are all good reasons, but it's different from punishing for because of this notion of just desert, because he deserves it. And that's crucially, uh, that's really what 
the denial of the libertarian notion of free will entails as far as the notion of moral responsibility, that it really undermines the notion of just deserts, the notion of, well, we're going to punish you because you deserve to be punished because you could have done otherwise. So punishing for the sake of punishing, for the sake of making someone suffer because they deserve it, now is undercut. But that doesn't mean that obviously, and I, I really emphasize this, doesn't mean that we should run, let criminals run free. There are plenty of other very good reasons why we want to make sure that criminals are, you know, so, so let, let, so we, we've, we've, we've now segued into the, into that yes. third, uh, that third area that we were talking about. So beyond the personal and into societal. the, the societal, um, but let's, let's just, let's just focus on this retribution aspect for a moment. Like one of the, one of the main justifications for having a criminal justice system, for having a, a, you know, a, a set of laws, to having the police, to having a courts and 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 uh, and uh, a finding of facts, and for having and for having a, the, the the jailing system is to uh, have at least one step removed from the very human uh, tendency towards retribution. You have stolen from me. Or you have you have killed a loved one, a family member. I am going to exact revenge upon you. I'm going to burn your house down, or I'm going to kill a member of your family, or I'm going to steal something even more valuable from you. I'm not. Not only am I going to make things right and like make myself whole in some way, but I'm going to punish you so that you will never think about doing it again, and neither will anybody else. But this led to the Hatfields and the McCoys uh, from from Mark Twain, uh, just a, an endless series of revenge back and forth where no one could remember who the like, who did what to start it right. off. Um, and it led to an enormous, you know, there, it, this leads to an incredible amount of, of violence in, in society. So we, we, we instituted laws and court and police and, and courts and jails. Uh, so, so that people don't act on what, what is very much a part of human nature and that sense of retribution. Yeah. But, but you're saying that, uh, but what I'm hearing you say is that, in fact, a large part of even our laws and our jails and our courts are based on the principle of retribution. So, I mean, look at how harsh they can be. Take, for example, what happened recently in Alabama. Uh, somebody was executed uh, with, uh, by nitrogen uh, aproxia. That's just barbarism right there. There's nothing humane about that. So take the United States, for example. The United States is a very interesting country. It's rich and powerful, but it's also an outlier in many ways. It's one of the few developed countries that still imposes on its citizens the death penalty. Now we can ask, mm -hmm. okay, why is that? Okay, so we can think through the reasons why we have the death penalty. Um, well, you could say, look, we are a civilized society, so of course, we don't kill just for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, taking revenge or something, but we kill for other reasons. Okay, so what could those be? You mentioned, say, deterrence. Uh, well, whether or not the death penalty is a deterrent now becomes an empirical question. You know, we can do studies and try to figure out whether it is or not, right? Um, and so if it turns out that it isn't a deterrent, as I think most of the evidence suggests, if it turns out that it's not, uh, you know, uh, more expensive, sorry, less expensive than keeping people in jail as it isn't, then you ask yourself, what, why do we still have it? And in fact, why does the rest of the world, the, the trend in that, in that regard is towards uh, abolition, definitely. Over the years, more and more countries have um, abolished the death penalty. The U.S. stands uh, not alone, but uh, it's one of the few developed countries that still has it. Okay, what purpose does it serve then? If you can show empirically that it doesn't deter, that it doesn't uh, cost, uh, you know, less money and so on and so forth, well, that's, so that's one way. The fact that we have institutions like, you know, governments and laws doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean there's no room for improvement. Doesn't mean that um, society and societal conditions uh, and that uh, aspects of the criminal justice systems aren't really harsh and punitive. Uh, look in the U.S. at the uh, incarceration rate. Uh, we are also unique in how many people we incarcerate. You know, we've been called the incarceration nation. The, the rate of incarceration is off the charts compared to other developed nations. 
so yeah, there's, there are many aspects of our criminal justice system that are harsh and punitive and, and unnecessarily so. And that, so even if we have, uh, you know, government and institutions and everything, and uh, there's uh, this progress that could be made there as other countries uh, have. So one approach would be to move from a system that is harsh and punitive to one that uh, is focused more on prevention of crime, if that's what we care about, and rehabilitation of criminals, especially. Take, for example, people who commit minor offenses, like they're caught with a few grams of, you know, uh, a pot of something in their pocket or something like that, and they end up in jail. Is that is that uh, not a harsh? Of course it is harsh. Uh, of course it's um, punitive. And uh, of course we can do better. So I think that you're right about the fact that we have made progress. <laughs> it's not a free-for-all anymore, uh, but uh, there's still plenty of progress to be made. And I think that um, undermining those intuitions that people deserve uh, the, the, the suffering that they get for committing certain acts is one way forward. Okay, so you've you've talked about uh, you, you you've talked about the uh, the death penalty and and just empirically, there's research showing that it's not cheaper because the appeals in the court cases are exactly. so expensive yeah. that it's actually it's actually less expensive to keep them isolated and that it's not a deterrent. It, uh, places with the death penalty aren't less violent than uh, than places without. But there's but there's also a, a more general deterrence factor. We don't want jails to be. Um, uh, nice places goes the argument uh, because we want people to feel like their rights are being curtailed for a limited of time. Um, we want them to be uh, nasty places for punishment, again, for deterrence. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the argument here so that um, A, the person will do anything, once they do get out, they'll do anything they can to avoid going back in. And B, um, uh, and B, other people will see what those nasty conditions are and then say, yeah. you know what, it's not it's not worth the, the cost if I get caught is so high. It's not worth whatever yeah. benefit uh, I get from 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 doing um, from doing the crime. And there is and I, mean, I think there is still uh, uh, and these these people are are bad. They did something really nasty to society. And and I think there is uh, that. And then we, we get back to the very human uh, urge of. You know what? And if they suffer a little bit for its own sake, but I'm okay with that. Like I've, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard those, I've heard those three yeah. arguments against making jails less yeah. brutal. But you, oh, you've heard than the they version are. what you just said is a version of retribution. Oh yeah, they deserve to suffer, right? Yes. The first argument is well, you know, let's make those places nasty so that it will deter. That's an empirical question. Okay. Yes, I, the first two. So the first two are. Are, are also it's an empirical. empirical question, and I don't think the evidence uh, suggests that this actually goes through. Uh, I don't think that by simply making jails nasty and making people suffer, you somehow, uh, you know, uh, make a country safer and having look. Take a take a look at the U.S. for example. Okay, um, the it, as far as crime, let's not talk about say gun violence because the U.S. is off the charts as far as homicides by guns, as as you know, every other. Day, there's a mass shooting somewhere in the U.S., right? But otherwise, it's comparable to other countries. Um, but, you know, as far as gun violence, it's off the charts. We also have ve a very harsh system. Okay, so what, what's the argument now? So if we have such a harsh system with the death penalty and everything, we should have much less violence then. But we don't, at, at least in the, in the, in the case of, of guns, but also in, in general. So, again, these are all empirical. I, I agree that once you remove the... Uh, retributive urge because it, it's nonsensical. Uh, the idea that someone deserves to suffer because, as you said, they're bad. That's that feels correct intuitively. If you think it through, it doesn't make uh, much uh, much sense. Uh, then the question becomes: Okay, how do we want to set up societies, assuming that the goal is that we would like for there to be as little crime as possible? Uh, we would like to. Uh, people who end up, you know, doing bad things would like to rehabilitate them so that they don't, you know, they are, they become, if it's possible, uh, productive members of society again, and so on and so forth. So these are the goals that should motivate us. And um, to achieve these goals, we have to try to, as a society, this is not simple, but think through what uh, what is the best evidence. So 
one person, I'm going to mention somebody else whose work is really good in that regard that your listeners would be interested in, is a philosopher called uh, Greg Caruso. And uh, he has written a number of books and articles. One of them is called uh, Moral Responsibility Reconsidered. He has a very interesting approach to the societal problems that sort of equates the problem of criminal justice uh, to uh, a uh, public health uh, sort of uh, approach. So, you know, how do we deal with uh, offenders, criminals, and stuff like that uh, is, on the analogy, very similar to how we should deal with people who carry some virus or other, like during the pandemic. Um, if you carry a virus, you're a danger to other people for, you know, contamination, but that doesn't mean we you're a bad person, doesn't mean that we want to make you suffer. Right. There's, there's, there's no, no moral taint, it's just... But because it, but it's, it's not your true. fault that you carry uh, a virus like this. Likewise, I don't think anybody asks to become a psychopath, for example. It's not like you, you know, I, you know what you'd like to do when you go out, I'd like to be a psychopath. Or, you know. Okay, so it, it's... <laughs> I'm going to read you a quote, if I may, that I think is really beautiful that goes back on, on that question that goes back centuries about um, this idea that uh, people who have certain pathologies who are violent, of course it's a problem. Of course we should do something about it. Ultimately, it's not something that uh, they have control over in this metaphysical sense that we've been talking about. So here's now somebody... Uh, he was a materialist of the 18th century. Uh, he shares, uh, I, we have the same first name. His name was Julien. Offred de la Maitrie was his last name. And here's what he uh, says. He says, uh, look at how the materialist, so he was arguing against the Cartesian doctrine of the soul with this kind of libertarian free will. So look at how the materialist will treat others. He will pity the wicked without hating them. He'll think of them as merely men whose construction was bungled. He goes on to say, it's short, the materialist ignores the grumblings of his vanity and is convinced that he is only a machine, an animal, and he won't ill-treat his fellows. He knows too much about the nature of their bad behavior. That's the essence of uh, the denial of libertarian free will. Um, and that, that's, I think, the consequences for... Um, how we ought to treat others and, and the kind of system that we ought to put in place if we want to do it, um, you know, humanely and rationally. Yeah. And that, I mean, that sentiment is very much in keeping with my secular humanist viewpoint of the world. I really want, I, what I strive to do in my activism and with and with this podcast in, in many ways is is to create the conditions for for human thriving to help uh, explore issues in a in an in, in an intelligent way so that people can have greater understanding and with greater understanding that will inform our actions to hopefully improve in, improve things both for ourselves and 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 our communities around us. Uh, I, so that's we've talked a lot about libertarian free will, why it's false, how it. Uh, shapes a lot of society's intuitions and its institutions. I'd like to shift and, and talk more about uh, compatibilism, or, or uh, that that you that we spoke about a little bit earlier. The one that you say most scientists embrace. Can you get into a little bit more depth in in what compatibilism um, entails, like so we can understand what it is and when we talk about it? And then I want to move into how we kind of rebuild mm -hmm. those. Uh, uh, those intuitions that we have that we've demolished, yeah. uh, and, and so that we've got something standing at the end of our conversation. So let's start with what is compatibilism? What is this other sense of, of free will, or at least of making choices? Yeah, compatibilism is simply saying, look, we can have our cake and eat it too, in the sense that we can say that we have free will without saying something that contradicts uh, what we know about the, the laws of nature. That's basically compatibilism in a nutshell, and that's perfectly doable. Um, as long All right. As so tell me, tell me how. Okay, I, I, so I, let's get into that. Uh, it's because because that's you, that claim is not that is not intuitively obvious to me. I so see. I'd like you to explain it a little bit more, please. Okay. So as we said at the very beginning, uh, when we talk about free will, we can define it in different ways. Right? We talked about the libertarian uh, case, and so now we say, look, this is scientifically suspect. So. Um, let me define free will some other way that's not going to uh, 
encounter the problems that we discuss. So how can we do that? Well, we can say something like this. We human beings are complex creatures with, um, you know, a complex, uh, flexible mental life. We have beliefs and desires and goals. And um, we'd like to be free to act on our beliefs, desires, and goals with some limits, obviously. Right? We live in a society, so we can't just do anything. But within the limits imposed by the norms of society, then uh, you could say that you are free in the sense that you can uh, act on your goals, beliefs, and desires without uh, duress, without infringement. So that would be, so let's say, for example, that after we're done chatting, I want to have gelato, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, okay, um, that's a desire that I have. And um, if I go and do it, then that's it. I've exercised my free will. That's a sense in which we can define free will. Um, and but that, that seems all right. I, 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 but that seems to be a little bit of. Uh, 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 I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound accusatory, but like, this seems a little bit like a bait and switch, right? like because we're shifting the levels here. Of course, we have. When we were, because we when, we when we were talking about free will before, we're talking about the level of like within the individual, like what the actions that a person takes. Yeah. And then when we're talking about free will in this in the second sense. We're no longer talking so much about the levels of the individual, but we're talking more on the social. You are you're not you're not facing you're not facing any external constraints. Nobody yeah. is stopping you yeah. or will punish you yeah. for having gelato. Yeah. But 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 the uh, but the first question is if you choose if you want ice cream if you choose ice cream or gelato yeah. well you don't have a choice in the matter you're already going to go with gelato because of uh your genetics and history and uh and every everything that has led you up to this moment and that incredibly complex set of interactions so we're talking about essentially two different levels are two different phenomenon, but we're using the same phrase to describe them. That, and that's what we have to do, right? The, you're right. There, there are different levels of analysis there, right? Um, so another, I want to point to another piece that I think your listeners will find interesting. It's a piece by uh, the physicist Sean Carroll. It's a blog post in which, uh, and the title is very interesting. It's, it's called uh, Free Will is as Real as Baseball. Okay, and it doesn't get any more real than baseball. So, what, what, so what he's saying is a version of what you're saying that uh, one level of analysis, a, a, a more fundamental level of analysis, um, in the ontology of say basic physics, there is no such thing as an uncaused cause or uh, anything that corresponds to libertarian free will. Okay, but when we 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 don't operate and talk about things only at this level. Uh, if we go several levels up, we talk about human beings now, and at that level of analysis, we're agents uh, endowed with certain powers of reason, we make choices and so on and so forth. So it's perfectly fine to say those things if, as long as we're clear about the level of analysis at which we're talking. So again, I wanna bring an analogy to explain what I mean by these different levels. Um, suppose that, so I mentioned chess earlier, right? Cause I like playing chess and it's fun. Um, so suppose that somebody were to see two people play chess and doesn't know what the game is or what's going on. And they say, well, what's going on? Like I see people moving little pieces on this board, what's happening. And suppose that there's a physicist there and uh, the person says, well, you're a physicist. It, the, what the chess set is made up of matters, elementary particles. Why don't you tell us, you know, explain to us what's going on based on the laws of fundamental physics. The task with the physicists would probably laugh because the task is ludicrous, right? This is not the right level of analysis. You're not going to invoke the rule of the rules of say quantum field theory to explain what's happening on the chessboard. You have to move up several levels of analysis. At those levels of analysis, you invoke notions like pawn, bishop, moving along a diagonal, uh, moving along, you know, uh, straight lines. And then you can have an explanatory framework to make sense of what people are doing on the board. Now, the concepts that you invoke at that higher level of analysis are not incompatible with the uh, basic laws of physics. The fact that you say that's a bishop doesn't violate the laws of physics, right? So 
But notice that now you are using concepts that simply don't exist at a more fundamental level to explain right. same thing for human beings. You can it's a, a much higher level of at abstraction a, at, a live, at a higher level of abstraction. You know, we're mm -hmm. not just bags of elementary particles. We are autonomous agents endowed with minds and desires and beliefs. And we can make a lot of sense and explain a lot about human beings at that level of analysis by invoking those notions, including the notions of choice. We can say, hey, Julian, I have a choice now. I kind of, my sweet tooth is calling. After the interview with Leslie, I'm going to have something sweet. I could go with gelato or, you know, cheesecake, for example. Okay. And that's a choice. That's a potential choice I could make. And I'm going to make the choice. Let's say I end up saying I'm going to have cheesecake. And have I made a genuine choice? Yes, because there were several options and I picked one. Now we can say, aha, wait, but was that choice determined? Yeah, but who cares? Okay, it was. of course it was determined. It was determined by a host of complex factors, but that doesn't mean that I didn't make a choice in a significant way in the sense that there were several options. And by the way, that choice was made in alignment with my own desires and beliefs. Suppose I Suppose ultimately that upon deliberating on the question of whether I should have gelato or cheesecake, I come to the conclusion, I'm like, well, you know what? I had gelato a couple nights ago. Uh, the place that I went to wasn't very good. I, I've heard of a new place that has cheesecake. It looks fantastic. Therefore, I'm going to go there. Okay, now I've made a choice based on my own thinking, my own desires, my own beliefs, my own calculations, and that choice led me to want to have cheesecake. Okay, I've made a free choice. Nobody was around to tell me otherwise. Uh, and the choice is free in the sense that it is in harmony with what I want, what I believe, what I desire. And I think that's what more would we want? What more would we want right. of a theory of free will than that? Well, I, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to answer that because I mean, I, I, I'm with you in the sense that I want like maximal, like the free will that you're talking about, maximal free will for the, the maximum freedom for the greatest number of people subject really only to the, that uh, your freedom doesn't impinge on the freedom of anyone well, else. And, and when that, you get those, yeah, yeah. those conflict, right, I, I, I think we're largely in agreement there, but uh, um, what more could any, could anyone ask? So let's go back to, that sense of personal moral responsibility uh -huh. without free will. If, if, if choice yeah. uh, uh, between A and B is uh, you know, at the level of the choice uh, is essentially an illusion, then that, that does kind of, we've talked about eliminating moral responsibility in terms of uh, like, like criminals and, and, and uh, um, not, not punishing them, but, but trying to reform the institution so that we, uh, uh, we do things that actually work in terms of quarantining them and minimizing recidivism. But what about on the flip side of, like, I make choices that I think are going to be best. And sometimes I really struggle with those. And I know that I, a, lot of, a lot of my peers, a lot of my friends do so as well. Mm -hmm. um, how do we build back up that sense, uh, that, that, that moral system uh, without, without free will at its core? Of, uh, of choices matter because actions have consequences. Those consequences affect those around you in ever great, greater circles. Yeah. But at the center of that, of that circle is that's why our choices matter. That's why the, our actions have moral weight. Help me rebuild that my, a moral system that doesn't have free will at, it, at, its, at its core. Please. Yes. I, I, so I think we do that by divorcing two things, divorcing the okay. notion of moral responsibility from the notion of morality. The, the, okay. the, the, the notion of morality remains, what, what is morality? Morality is simply that there are, a, there's a class of behaviors that human beings can engage in that we either find blameworthy or praiseworthy, right? Um, okay. So you can be, you know, you can do something that's morally, uh, a, admirable, or you can do something that's morally despicable, right? Uh, you can be a saint or you can be evil. That's separate. That remains. Whether or So let's say that, you know, we take a concrete example, like helping others, being charitable, morally praiseworthy. Okay, wonderful. We applaud. That's great. Hurting people for, you know, the wrong reasons, terrible. 
whether or not we have free will in the in the determine in the uh, libertarian sense doesn't change that. That remains that that system remains in place. We still want certain classes of human behaviors to have those properties. Okay, so morality is not affected as a system by the lack of moral responsibility. Now, moral responsibility is affected only in so far as we come to the conclusion that. Uh, there's a, there's a form of it that is an illusion, meaning that when people do something, ultimately, they're not metaphysically free, uh, they are caused. Uh, and what we try to do then is we say, okay, look, we want to keep the system. Of course, we want societies to not collapse. We don't want to let anybody do anything they want. So we keep everything in place. Nothing changes. And morality doesn't change. Uh, but what we try to do is we try to be rational about how to bring about uh, desirable outcomes. So let's say that one outcome that we'd like is to lower crime, right? Okay, so that's a desirable outcome, let's say. Then we think about it, and we think about how to do that. And we try to think about, okay, well, what do we know, say, about the determinants of crime in a society? And we know some things about that, um, you know, uh, poverty and racism and uh uh, mental illness, and you know, we can we say, well, maybe you could try to prevent those things and do something about them. Uh, okay, once crime is committed, which will happen inevitably, we say, okay, great. What what sh- what should our response be? Right, and one response I think, which is not the right response, is to say, well, that person did something bad; they deserve to be, you know, put as we said earlier in harsh conditions and. We don't do that blindly. We ask ourselves, okay, what outcome do we want? Well, one outcome that we want, certainly, if somebody does something bad, is we want to make sure that they don't strike again to protect, you know, so we can in- incapacitate the person in some way or other to make sure they don't strike again. Then we should ask ourselves, okay, um, so in other words, the first question is, what level of danger does the person pose? Forget about moral responsibility now. Let me ask, what level of danger does the person pose? And here the answer depends. Suppose that the person in mind is a child. Sometimes children commit crimes. Sometimes a five-year-old finds a gun in a house and accidentally kills uh, their little sister. That's a tragedy. It's a crime. Uh, And we can ask ourselves, okay, well, what should we do? We certainly don't want to impose the death penalty on the child or put them in jail for 20 years because we think about it. And in that case, we say what well, we ask, well, what's the level of danger that the five-year-old poses? Well, since it was an accident, uh, and if there are no more guns lying around the house, maybe we say it's unlikely that that person's a real psychopath at five and it's going to go around killing people. So maybe what we do is minimal. And we proceed on a case-by-case basis. If the person now is not a five-year-old, but let's say it's now somebody who uh, commits a crime. And it turns out that we discover that that person had the brain tumor that was impinging on certain areas of his brain to make him violent. We say, well, okay, that we understand now the causes of the criminal behavior. Maybe we could try to do something about this. Could some surgeon operate and maybe remove the tumor? Maybe yes, maybe no. Now, suppose we take a psychopath who committed a crime. We don't have a cure currently for psychopathy, so it's not clear that we can just intervene and rewire the person's brain. Uh, to change that. But if we could, we probably would, right? So th- that's how I think we should think about um, about crime. Uh, we should think about trying to prevent, just like Greg Caruso uh, has it in his analogy. It's like a public um, health model. We should try to prevent it if it's possible. We should try to set up societies that uh, minimize the conditions under which people are going to become violent. If we care about this, it's not at all what we do in the U.S., by, uh, by the way, but that's something what one could do. And once crimes are committed, we should think about uh, first, you know, do, do we have the right person when we catch them? Is that the person that did commit the crime or do we have some innocence in, on our hands? And if we determine that they're guilty, we ask, well, what level of danger do they pose? And based on our determination of that, we do something about that. If we think that the level of danger is really high and that that person will strike again, then we try to do something to make sure it doesn't happen. But none of that entails being harsh or you know, uh, you know, uh, punitive uh, and making these people suffer, unless, of course, one could come up with a good reason and say, look, if we make people suffer and waterboard them for two hours a day, 
then it has all these wonderful societal benefits. Then we could start to think about whether, I'm just taking an example, waterboarding, whatever it is, uh, has some value. But I think all these questions are, ought in principle in a society to be resolved rationally based on the best scientific evidence that we have about what causes these various outcomes and so on and so forth. So to wrap up and answer your question, nothing changes about our moral system. The only thing that changes very narrowly by the denial of libertarian free will is that there are certain ways of punishing people for certain reasons that cease to make sense. That's not a bad outcome. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess one reason that it, 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 it does have a big effect on me is that uh, the, the sense of my, I attach a great deal of moral responsibility to my own actions. That's great, wonderful, uh, and and well, yeah. Except that, except that, that if that proves to be a, an illusion, then then, then that's, it doesn't matter uh, in that sense. Then, because suppose that suppose that based on that so called illusion, you behave in ways that mm -hmm. are beneficial to others. That's what matters. It doesn't matter why you whether it's because it's an illusion or not. Um, all right. Well, then, then my last, then my last question, then, because uh, because it's a big one. Um, if it doesn't, if there is no moral responsibility in for that my actions, narrow sense, doesn't mean we can't like free will, right? It doesn't yeah. mean we can't define moral responsibility in a way that is compatible. It's like free will. We, you know, you say that there's no free will. Well, it depends what you mean. So there's no moral responsibility in that narrow sense. We have to. Right. Right. So, but again, I've heard, I've, I'm, I'm channeling, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling arguments that I've heard from others. Okay. Uh, and I, it's essentially the same reason, like it, this, it, it's essentially the same argument that I hear of uh, when people uh, learn that I, I don't believe in a God. If you don't believe in God, then why don't you just rape, murder, pillage, steal, et cetera. And if there's no responsibility, and I, 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 I know the answer to that certainly from a you know, theistic uh, perspective, but if there's no, um, if there's no free will, yes. why put all of this effort into uh, uh, behaving morally? Why not just take the uh, path of least resistance? Why, why not do the easy thing? Why fight so often to do the right thing? Because for a lot of people, uh, and, and, and in, including myself for, for a long time, it's, uh, it is that sense of moral responsibility and placing a great deal of weight mm -hmm. on the value of, that, uh, of the assignment of moral responsibility in the positive column. If suddenly that ledger doesn't exist, it's not, it's not so much, all right, I'm going to rape, pillage, and plunder. That's, that's not it. But am I really... Is it really worth it to put all that effort into doing the right thing instead of the the easy or the expedient thing? So yeah. uh, it, I'm drawing an analogy between that and the theistic argument, but it's not because it, I, I think there are some similarities there. But it's only an analogy, yeah. and I'd like you to address like the moral the, yeah. the moral aspect. Well, the first, this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the response, but the yeah the, the <laughs> argument that somehow if you don't believe in God, why go kill and rape is to simply silly. I mean, we can talk about it if you'd like, but it's not. No, no, I, I, I agree that it's silly. It's, it's common, which is why I, I uh, which is why I brought it up. But it, I, I do agree that that it's silly. Like that, that, if if someone, if the only reason that someone isn't raping is because they're afraid of God, then I, I'm, I'm scared of that person. Exactly. Yeah. So, but the other, your other uh, question is, well, look, you want to do certain things because you know as a human being with a power of reason that uh, doing the right thing helping others uh, and so on and so forth is going to do a number of things it's going to help others it's going to make society better in a small way and it's going to make you feel good in the process so these are good reasons in and of themselves to want to do those things you don't have to then say oh well i want an additional reason i want there to be some kind of mess of metaphysical we will so that you don't need that there are plenty of reasons to as you say do the right thing and then it, it, in practical matters it, at the end of the day it's it's a sort of a personal matter some people decide under some circumstances sometimes to do the right thing and sometimes not and uh that's the way you know we are as human beings but if you want to find reasons for doing the right things even in the absence of libertarian free will there are plenty 
I mean, so, you know, like, so take your loved ones. Like, wh why do nice things to them if you don't have free will? Cause, because, you know, that makes them feel good because you want that, because you love them. And so that, these are plenty of reasons. And it doesn't matter if you don't have libertarian free will. That's just, that's a red herring. That's not, that's orthogonal to the question. So I, I hear you that it is shocking in some sense to come to that conclusion that the world and in particular, we do not function the way that we intuitively believe we do. But at the end of the day, it's perfectly, we've learned to make major adjustments in that regard about how the world works in the course of history. And we used to think that the earth was at the center of everything. We used to think that we were created, uh, you know, in the image of God and didn't evolve. We used to think, okay, well, that's not how the world works, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't change things fundamentally for us. I, I do find myself having more sympathy for those that uh, are learning that the or at the, that people at when people at the time learned that the Earth was not the center of the universe and that the sun did not rotate around the you Earth. You know, they could have made so. they could have made the same argument. They could have said, "Look, we were told this for such a long time. This is such an important thing. You know, if that if we're not special, then why bother? Why get up in the morning?" Why, right. You, the same argument could be made, and and the, the same answer remains. There are plenty of other reasons to want to do those things, regardless of whether we have libertarian free will, the earth uh, is uh, you know, at the center of the universe or not. Um, so I think there's, that's what I told you about earlier, that there's a sense in which uh, denying this particular conception of free will changes nothing. And there's a, a, a sense in which it, it changes everything. Uh, it changes everything in the sense that it makes people like you like, wow, uncomfortable, like Jesus, that's really shocking. Like I, Really, it's not the way I, I function. That's really, I used to think that and stuff like that. And it doesn't change anything because at the end of the day, n n virtually nothing that you do in your daily life um, hinges on that. Apart from, again, when you have to evaluate certain, if you were like, you know, in a jury or uh, an attorney or some legal person to, to judge a criminal and decide what to do with them. Or even you know so that that would that would change now, but uh, that's a I don't think that's a huge adjustment to make. Um, and I think right, the materialist well, of the 18th century uh, already understood that, and you know already drew the conclusions um, a couple hundred years ago that uh, this was in fact a desirable uh, outcome that we could then learn to be more humane because we understand how things. I'll end with another quick analogy in that regard. Um, so the bigger point that this makes is that a better, more informed understanding of the world can lead to better, uh, more humane behavior. So let's take the example, the old example of witches. You know, in medieval times, people used to think that there were women cavorting with demons doing all kinds of evils. They were witches. And they would subject these women to all kinds of horrible treatment because they really believed that they were witches. Oh, and now we've made progress. We don't believe in witches anymore. What's the consequence? Well, the consequence, it would just, the justification now for inflicting all this suffering on women just is not there anymore. That's progress. And that comes from a better understanding of the world. So the argument would be that, you know, morally, uh, we are, we ought to be compelled, given that as a uh, species, we know certain things um, through science and everything that we ought to apply this knowledge and not, you know, disregard it when we make moral decisions and moral calculations. Otherwise, uh, it's you know, it's not a not not a good outcome. So I think that's a very optimistic uh, um, conclusion, and it points to the fact that there's some connection between our understanding of the world. Um, through science mostly, and, and uh, this desire that we have to do the right thing and to behave morally. As we discussed earlier, you know, if we want to try to, if we're serious about trying to, in some country or other, prevent crime, and there are ways to begin to think about it. Um, well, Dr. Julian Mussolino, uh, thank you for helping me grow up, for broadening my mind and uh, and, and expanding my, my perspective. Uh, 
This has been wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me on Podcast for Inquiry. I'll give you the last word. Any any final thoughts? Uh, le- listen, it was a, a pleasure to uh, chat with you. I want to thank you very much for the invitation. These are, as you said, these are you know non-trivial issues to discuss. It was just wonderful to have the time uh, to talk to you about this. And uh, I hope that we said enough. I hope that uh, things will be clear to your listeners. And, and if not, then people are always free to reach out to me if there are you know, questions. And I'll, I'll try to respond if I... Right. So uh, uh, how can people reach you online uh, if they want to continue the conversation? Look further? me up online. They'll very easily find my uh, email addresses at Rutgers and they can uh, shoot me an email. I mean, I can't promise I'll respond, you know, like right away because I have, you know, things to do and everything. But I, I try to respond to people who are genuinely, uh, you know, have questions and want to, you know, engage and everything. So that, that's something I enjoy doing. All right. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, please show your support at patreon.com slash podcast for inquiry and give us a five-star review. Email us at podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. The Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting reason, compassion, and secular values. Help us support rational discourse and evidence-based decision-making by becoming a member at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. CFIC is on the web, centerforinquiry.ca. We are on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or x at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Zach Dumont and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt. See you next time. Mm-hmm.